Welcome back to the E Pluribus Unus Mundus series. This is the fifth video and we are still going over the third paper which is entitled E Pluribus Unus Mundus Natural Law in the Holographic Empyrean. So in this video we'll be going over <coughs> Leo Strauss's book Natural Right and History. Leo Strauss, controversial figure because his students became politically active in the neoconservative movement, which started in the Democratic Party in the United States of America, went to the Republicans in the 1980s, and then in the past few years has returned to the Democratic Party. There's a lot of conspiracy theories about the neocons and the Straussian cabal, but Leo Strauss himself, and he published this book in 1950, was a self-described platonic political philosopher and I think he describes the various philosophical alternatives that surround issues like natural rights and Plato's theory of the absolute ideas more thoroughly than most and it's well worth reading his book to describe the situation that I'm addressing in this series of papers and videos which is how to unite the left and the right of the United States of America. So my suggestion is to add two amendments to the Constitution. The first, equate each psyche with the gravitational singularity and the encompassing horizon of the cosmos. And the second is that a fourth branch of government to help the other three integrate their decision-making processes with that fundamental ordering principle, psyche equals singularity, which is based on a comparison of Carl Jung's archetypal psychology and Leonard Susskind's holographic string theory. And I discussed the foundations of these ideas in the previous videos, and they are based on the ideas I express in my book, Psyche and Singularity, Jungian Psychology, and Holographic String Theory. Okay, in the previous videos we discussed Thomas Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas' Natural Law Theory, and I examined Martin Luther King Jr.'s references to Aquinas' Natural Law Theory in his letter from a Birmingham jail. And I also discussed Carl Jung's book, or his essay, The Undiscovered Self, which he published in 1956, and in which he discussed the tension between the left and the right, the political tension, which manifested within Western society and between the Western and Eastern European societies, with Russia being the communist nation. In this video, as I said, I'll be going over Leo Strauss. So on page 29 of the paper, this is something Leo Strauss is talking about. So he was a German Jew who left Germany because of the Nazis and he came to the United States of America and he noted that in the same way that Greek philosophy conquered the Roman Empire that conquered Greece, so has German philosophy, specifically what he calls historicism, overthrown American academia after the United States of America overthrew Germany in World War II. So what he discusses a lot in this book about natural right and history, are natural rights truly natural? Are they rooted in some universal eternal principles that never change? Or are they historically and culturally relative? That's historicism. So this is what Leo Strauss says. This is from page eight, or no, page two of his book in the introduction. And it's page, uh, actually 30 now on this E Pluribus Unus Mundus series. So. He says, the majority among the learned, who still adhere to the principles of the Declaration of Independence, interpret these principles not as expressions of natural right, but as an ideal, if not as an ideology or a myth. Present-day American social science, as far as it is not Roman Catholic social science, is dedicated to the proposition that all men are endowed by the evolutionary process or by a mysterious fate with many kinds of urges and aspirations, but certainly with no natural right. So the Declaration of Independence says that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. The liberal left-wing section of society, as a democratic regime evolves through time, tends to lose their taste for the idea of God, because God is the supreme monarch, and equality is the fundamental principle of the democracy. So it's not very egalitarian, to worship some supreme, overarching, hierarchical, patriarchal God. However, when you get rid of God from the equation, 
the foundation for the idea of natural rights falls away as well. That's just a, a fundamental problem. To reunite the left and the right, we have to agree about what is justice, what is right, and what is wrong. And that's difficult when neither side can agree about the standard by which they judge what is good and what is evil, or what is good and bad. It reminds me of Friedrich Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, but I'll get into that into another paper. But at any rate, what I'm going to focus on from the few selections I have from natural right and history is how the, the problem of natural rights and whether there are such things comes down to natural science. So, but let me just continue in the book. Uh, here's what Strauss says. He says, the issue of natural right presents itself today as a matter of party allegiance between two hostile camps, heavily fortified and strictly guarded. One is occupied by the liberals of various descriptions, the other by the Catholic and non-Catholic disciples of Thomas Aquinas. So it's St. Thomas Aquinas's natural law theory from Summa Theologica. In a nutshell, Thomas Aquinas says that humans are endowed with reason. This is the light of God's countenance. We have reason, which enables us to discover the eternal law of God's government of the universe. So God orchestrates and organizes the universe through what Aquinas calls eternal law. It's the laws of physics and the laws of psychology. Natural law is when humans use reason to analyze the eternal law that God inscribes into the universe to discern what is morally right and wrong for humans to do. And what is morally good is to pursue those desires that God has implanted in us. And it is evil to go against those natural desires and the natural goals towards towards which they are aimed. So, for example, we have an instinct to survive, a survival instinct. We want to live. That's a natural desire that we have, and therefore we have a right to life. It is wrong to kill somebody without a good reason, such as self-defense, because God implanted in that person a natural desire to live. And God, being a perfect, all-powerful being, wouldn't have implanted someone with a desire if it wasn't good for that person to strive for it. Another example in the Catholic Church, to show how this could be controversial in the paper, I say just because you accept natural law theory, the basic principles, doesn't mean you have to accept the Catholic application of it. For example, sex. We all have a sex desire, so it's good to pursue sexual relationships. However, the Catholic Church will say the goal of sex is procreation. So sex aimed at procreation is good, sex not aimed at procreation is evil because it goes against the natural purpose of sex. Others could say, well, procreation is one purpose for sex, another purpose is pleasure, expressing love. So there's a lot of ways that you could argue the point. And in this series of papers, I'm, I'm not trying to say that any particular public policy position or personal moral decision is right or wrong. All I'm trying to say is that to unite the left and the right if we install the two amendments I'm talking about, psyche equals singularity in a fourth branch to help others think through their policy decisions in the context of that equation, that if we have that arena in place, that will help the left and the right unite. That this understanding of each of us is one with a central singularity in the encompassing horizon of the cosmos, the mandala shape of the cosmos, has an automatic ability to unite opposites. This is related to Carl Jung's theory of the ultimate archetype of the self, which he calls the unus mundus, and the mandala images that emerge from it to compensate psyches that are pulled by opposing demands. I've gone over this in the previous video, so for now I'm going to continue in this paper here. So, I say, considering that I'm trying to unite the left and right, it should be stated here again that accepting the foundation of natural law theory does not automatically mandate an acceptance of Aquinas' Catholic application of it. So I just went over that. Uh, what I do say, however, is that indeed the political idea of natural equality, which is the special preserve of liberals, makes the most sense if it refers to each of us as the carrier of identical archetypes of the psyche including the idea of natural rights, which is exactly what psyche equals singularity indicates. So we want equality. Okay, in what way are we equal? Physically, we're not equal. You might say, yeah, well, we're not exactly equal, but physically and even mentally, we're close enough to being equal that we can just assume for legal purposes that we're all equal. 
Well, an even more exact definition of equality would be identifying each of us as an infinite point of energy that is also present at each point of the encompassing horizon of the cosmos. This is how Plato describes the soul in the Timaeus. And that out at that horizon of the cosmos are all the absolute archetypal forms of knowledge, what Plato called the ideas, and then following him, Augustine and Aquinas say these are the ideas of God's mind, or the Logos, it's Jesus himself incarnate at each point of this encompassing sphere. That is the cosmology within which natural law theory was developed, and I'm saying that that basic framework of cosmology has re-emerged, ironically, through Leonard Susskind, overtly an atheist, although he accidentally is reintroducing this ancient Greek, it's also found in ancient India, all the way through the medieval period, that cosmology is re-emerging, and it is within that cosmology that natural law theory and the idea of natural rights makes make sense, and it is within that mandalic image of the cosmos and the psyches who inhabit it that I say the left and the right can reunite with each other. I also point out here, I said, representing the green left in Earth in the Balance, Ecology, and the Human Spirit, Al Gore, who formerly ran for president, he was vice president under President Clinton, then he won the most popular votes for president, he lost according to the Electoral College, the, actually this is when the, um, the neocons were emerging in the George W. Bush administration, and there was, a, as I said, a lot of controversy about that. But at any rate, in his book, Earth and the Balance, Ecology and the Human Spirit, Al Gore puts forth a holographic understanding of the universe as the solution to the spiritual crisis behind the ecological crisis. He says we devour the ecosystem to try to fill the gap in our souls where we lack the relationship with the natural world. But if we see the world as a hologram, wherein each part has all of the qualities of the whole, including ourselves, we are one with nature, then we will love it again. And he says this is the antidote to the, the ecological crisis, which, ironically, he roots back to Plato, because he says Plato says our souls are separate from the material world, and that we exist out at the horizon of the cosmos, but he doesn't realize that Plato said yes, and the entire material world exists out there too, and it's projected inward from that absolute horizon of the cosmos, which is what holographic string theory says. Leonard Susskind says the past, the present, and the future are interwoven in a holographic film, a two-dimensional film surrounding the spherical border of the universe, where from our perspective on Earth, space-time is accelerating away from us at the speed of light, and that speed of light affects space-time in such a way that the past, the present, and the future are conserved at each point of the entire encompassing sphere. And I'm saying that that holographic horizon of the cosmos is the collective unconscious mind that Jung talks about, wherein the archetypes are superimposed upon each other. All right, so continuing here, I'm going to say now, according to Strauss, this is page 31 of the third paper of the E Pluribus Unis Mundus series, according to Strauss, faced with the fact that no two societies agree totally about what is morally good and evil, modern liberals in America tend to assert that, quote from Strauss, only unlimited tolerance is in accordance with reason, but this leads to the admission of a rational or natural right of every preference that is tolerant of other preferences, or, negatively expressed, of a rational or natural right to reject or condemn intolerant or all absolutist positions. So, liberals tend to say, since there's no absolute standard by which to judge what is good or evil, only unlimited tolerance is in accordance with reason. However, if you have a worldview that says, my worldview is absolutely correct and I do not tolerate yours, then you have a right, according to this idea of unlimited tolerance, to reject or condemn that absolutist position, because they are absolutely wrong. The point is it's a self-contradictory position to take. To claim that you don't have an absolute standard to judge what is good or evil, and then according to that standard, you then judge all points of view that claim to have this absolute point of view, and you're intolerant of them, that it's self-contradictory. So he says that in the name of tolerance, 
that liberalism becomes a seminary of intolerance. And I point out that this is the standard accusation conservatives make against liberals, especially on college campuses. Yet, on the other hand, the conservative claim that there are absolute moral values that apply everywhere in the universe at all times, regardless of subjective and cultural differences, faces the apparently insurmountable problem of proving it scientifically. So the left tends to say there's no absolute standards of moral right and wrong, and yet they tend to have a very moral absolutist opinion about people who do not accept this idea that there are no absolute standards of right and wrong. So that seems self-contradictory. The right wing says, yes, there are absolute standards. Well, what are they? Well, it says in the Bible or it says in the Quran or whatever document of revealed religion a person subscribes to. That violates the First Amendment of the Constitution. You can't base laws on the authority of some particular religious text, the separation of church and state. As I've said in previous videos, the separation of church and state does not mean the separation of God and state. In our Constitution, the idea of God is assumed to be a self-evident truth. That's where natural rights come from. What religion is, is particular details about God's relationship historically with particular people on earth and the wisdom that God is said to have revealed to particular people. That's religion. That's not supposed to be included as a guiding principle in our government. But the idea of God, understood as the creator of the laws of nature, is. Because that's the foundation of natural law theory. So continuing here, I say Strauss goes on to say, quote, that natural right in its classic form is connected with a teleological view of the universe, unquote. So a teleological view of the universe. Teleo, telos means the end or the purpose. Teleological means the universe was created with a purpose. Then Strauss says that this issue would seem to have been destroyed by modern natural science, the idea of natural right. From the point of view of Aristotle, and who could claim to be a better judge in this matter than Aristotle, the issue between the mechanical and the teleological conception of the universe is decided by the manner in which the problem of the heavens, the heavenly bodies, and their motion is solved. Now, in this respect, which from Aristotle's own point of view was the decisive one, the issue seems to have been decided in favor of the non-teleological conception of the universe. So, Aquinas said, this is natural law theory. There's the eternal law, and then there's the natural law that humans derive from the eternal law using reason. The eternal law includes the natural desires implanted in the human psyche. We ha it is right to pursue our natural desires. It is wrong to go against them. But is the universe created with particular purposes in place? Did, is there a God who implanted us with goals that are proper to strive for? And the issue between mechanical and the teleological conception of the universe, modern science seems to say no. It doesn't seem that the universe is created with any particular purposes and not any overall overriding purpose either. And if that is the case, and it's a purposeless universe, as Leonard Susskin certainly believes, and I'll read a quote from him in a moment, then there can be no such thing as natural law or natural rights. They're just conventions. Maybe they're noble lies, but they're not inherently true facts of the universe. So the mechanical view of the universe that began with the Copernican revolution when Copernicus said that the earth isn't the center of the universe, the earth revolves around the sun and the sun isn't the center of the universe either. It's just one point in this infinite universe. And then that trend culminated with Isaac Newton in 1687, the Principia Mathematica. So he presented this mechanistic physics that treats the universe as a big machine made of parts that are constructed of little ball bearing type atoms which endure through three dimensions of rigid space and one linear dimension of time flowing forward everywhere at a constant rate regardless of the various speeds through space and the directions that people are traveling. Relativity theory would change all of that in the 20th century. What we'll be pointing out here is that the 20th century evolution of physics after Newton reintroduces the same cosmology, the basic framework that Plato and Aristotle described in an uncanny way that is, it, it, to me it seems 
so important to recognize how this 20th century physics culminating with holographic string theory reintroduces this all of the major points of this teleological cosmology that it it's too precise to be accidental Carl Jung said if you're looking for archetypes then you should see the same basic patterns emerging in different societies throughout history that the psyche of the humans are the same regardless of the place and the time that they might emerge and so they're going to be discovering these same basic ideas again and again and this cosmology that Plato and Aristotle and then following them Augustine and Aquinas articulated is re-emerging in all of its basic points again in holographic string theory so much so with such detail that I think it warrants these constitutional amendments that I'm suggesting okay so what did Aristotle say what's his basic cosmology and the point that is so similar to holographic string theory he said that the universe is a series of spheres of homocentric spheres spheres with the same central point with earth in the middle and then the orbits of the planets and the fixed stars the constellations are in this outermost sphere but what causes the motion for Aristotle the universe is eternal and the outermost sphere has always been rotating around its axis this the entire universe doesn't move but the outermost sphere rotates well what causes that continuous motion he said God causes that motion and how does he define God when you go through his for example his book physics book 8 section 10 in particular for all of the reasons that I'm not going to go through here he defines God as a unextended point of infinite energy an eternal simple point with no parts and no extension in space with infinite energy that causes the outermost sphere of the cosmos to turn regularly not through any physical touching or pulling but through a, what Aristotle would call formal causation and he describes it as the love of this outermost sphere of fixed stars for this perfect point of self-absorbed consciousness of itself a gravitational singularity is defined as a point of infinite density and zero volume of space it implodes into itself at an infinite rate and it contains all of space-time every gravitational singularity contains the entire universe past present and future it's very similar to Aristotle's idea of God what is God God is this perfect point of infinite power condensed in a mathematical point with no extension in space and what does God do God just is so perfect that God contemplates God that's all God does and that perfection of God causes the outermost sphere of the cosmos to try to imitate God's perfection which the closest material thing you can have to this imitation of God's perfection is circular motion it has no beginning no middle and end at any rate the point is God in Aristotle's teleological cosmology exists as a point of infinite density existing at the outermost circumference of, of the universe according to holographic string theory the past the present and the future are conserved at each point of the outermost horizon of the cosmos where space-time is expanding away from the central earth our perspective on earth from our perspective it seems as if the horizon of the cosmos is where space-time is expanding at the speed of light the past the present and the future are interwoven at that outermost horizon and then they radiate back in on fundamental threads with the cosmic microwave background radiation when you compare that string theory cosmology to Carl Jung's near-death experience where he said in 1944 he had a heart attack his psyche rose above his body above the planet earth where he could look down and see the continents and see the oceans and the clouds he said from when he returned to his body it seemed to him as if each of us and lives in a little cube of illusion a little box of illusion of three-dimensional space tethered to the horizon of the cosmos by a thread and that out at the horizon the past the present and the future are interwoven blissfully and that psyches go there when they die this is also what Plato said in between lives incarnating in these material bodies 
Some souls, if they studied philosophy adequately, can rise up to the outermost horizon where the absolute idea is the absolute idea of justice, the absolute idea of beauty, the absolute idea of tree, and any other thing you could experience. They're all existing out there, culminating with the idea of the good itself, which contains all of the other absolute ideas. And that this world, this three-dimensional world, is like an illusion, like a shadow on the wall of a cave being radiate, radiating in from this outermost horizon. This is exactly what Leonard Susskind is saying. And I'm saying that's too much of a perfect match to be accidental. It's furthermore what Carl Jung, working with Wolfgang Pauli, the Nobel Prize winning co-founder of quantum mechanics, they work together to say that the laws of physics should have a mirror symmetry with the laws of psychology because mind and matter both emerge from the same infinite source, which they call the unus mundus, also the archetype of the self, God and the one. So to unite the left and the right, I'm saying that if we identify ourselves with this mandalic understanding of the self archetype, with this idea of being one with the central point of the universe, which is also somehow contained at each point of the outermost circumference. And then looking at Jung's theory that this mandala image emerges naturally from the collective unconscious to compensate a psyche that's pulled between opposing demands as the American psyche is, the laws of psychology of the individual, he says, work more or less the same way at the collective scale. That we are being pulled apart. We should expect some kind of a mandala image to help reunite us. I'm saying this is it. Okay, so, um, so that is the cosmology that's emerging. Every step of 20th century physics has taken us away from the mechanistic cosmology that Isaac Newton developed and that Darwin developed his biological theory within that Newtonian framework. Life is made of these little ball bearings that randomly combine in three dimensions of space over eons of time until they combine into the double helix DNA molecule that reproduces itself and then evolves through the species through random mutations and natural selection. That is the standard worldview taught in academia today. It's a mechanistic cosmology based on Newtonian physics and Darwinian biology. But the Newtonian presuppositions of Darwinian biology were overthrown by each advancement in 20th century physics, starting with special relativity in 1905, general relativity in 1915, quantum mechanics in 1927, and then holographic string theory ultimately in the early 1990s. And that when you unite relativity theory and quantum mechanics, which was the great achievement of holographic string theory with Leonard Susskind and his partner Gerard de Hooft, true to Jung's theory, these notoriously opposed theories of physics were united in the mandala of a black hole because the gravitational singularity requires both of those mutually, apparently mutually exclusive languages to work together. Singularity is infinite gravity. That's general relativity. It's infinitely small. That's quantum mechanics. They're forced to work together and they were reconciled in this cosmology that is so surprisingly similar to the Platonic Aristotelian Augustinian Aquinine, or however you use Aquinas's name as an adjective, that, that, which was all culminating in the medieval worldview that culminated with Dante, that this is the cosmology within which natural law theory was developed, and it is re-emerging just in time to help the left and the right reunite. Okay, so most social scientists accept this mechanistic Darwinian, Newtonian Darwinian cosmology within which there's no room for natural law theory. It doesn't make any sense. So I say, nevertheless, Social scientists still operate within Newton's mechanistic paradigm and Darwin's attendant theory of random biological evolution. Consequently, even the Christian followers of Aquinas are forced to accept what Strauss calls, quote, a fundamental, a fundamental typically modern dualism of a non-teleological natural science and a teleological science of man. As a result, he says, the fundamental dilemma in whose grip we are is caused by the victory of modern natural science. An adequate solution to the problem of natural right cannot be found before this basic problem has been solved. And I'm saying this basic problem has been solved when we synthesize Jungian psychology and holographic string theory. And that to apply that new 
that fusion of holographic string theory and Jungian psychology, that the ancient mandala image of the union of cosmos and psyche was re-emerging, and we can reinterpret natural law theory upon which our constitution is based. We can reinterpret it through this scientifically updated worldview. And that the very mandala structure of this cosmology is custom made, according to Carl Jung, to unite opposites. And this is what I think we're going to need to do to get over this division of each side projecting its shadow on the other, but neither side taking the time to define the fundamental terms that they use to praise their own side and condemn the other. That we need to define our fundamental terms within an agreed upon cosmology and that holographic string theory united with Jungian psychology is that cosmology. So I say now, an adequate solution to the problem of natural right is found in a fusion of Jungian psychology and holographic string theory, which restores a teleological science of nature within which a teleological social science like natural law theory makes sense. So are, do, are we really endowed by our creator with certain desires and that it's natural and good to pursue these natural desires? All right, instinctive desires. According to Carl Jung, to mention instinctive patterns of behavior automatically necessitates that you talk about instinctive patterns of perception, the archetypes. So if you have an instinctive pattern of behavior, it's rooted in some archetypal worldview. For example, the, the example that I used in the previous video, one that Carl Jung used, is the yucca moth. I think that's how you pronounce it at any rate. The yucca moth is born after its parents die, and yet it has a complicated egg-laying procedure where it has to take you know, pollen from one flower, roll it into like a stem, then slice a part of another flower and put the egg in and then insert this rolled up piece of pollen. I forget the exact details, but it's a complex structure that wouldn't just happen automatically. And yet this moth can perform it. No one ever taught it. It just knows it instinctively. So Jung says his theory of the archetypes is that the, in the moth's collective unconscious mind, it has this image of a yucca flower. When it sees an actual yucca flower, that resonates with this archetypal image, and that triggers this instinctive pattern of behavior. So, natural law theory says we have a natural right to pursue our natural desires, because God endowed us with our instinctive desires. Well, to link our instinctive desires with natural law theory, we'd have to say, well, those instincts are rooted to archetypes that exist out at the horizon of the cosmos, like Plato said. And like Jung, following Plato, agreed after his near-death experience when he felt himself merged with the past, present, and future, specifically at the horizon of the cosmos. Holographic string theory, at the very least, makes it plausible to suggest that the archetypes from which the material world is projected do exist out at the holographic horizon of the cosmos because at any rate, the material world is projected from there on these fundamental threads. Plato talked about those fundamental threads in the myth of Ur, the near-death experience of a soldier named Ur at the end of the Republic, his most famous dialogue. Those kinds of parallels are so numerous and so precise, I'm saying that this is the evidence Jung and Pauli, a Nobel Prize winning co-founder of quantum mechanics, said that we, we should look for it. And it, it has re-emerged, I believe. And to, to such a clear extent that it warrants these constitutional amendments that I'm talking about. And how, so first of all, the idea of archetypes of the collective unconscious existing at the cosmic horizon. That is one part of the teleological science of nature. The other part is everything is striving, according to Aristotle, to imitate and emulate the God archetype or God, this point of infinite energy, this infinitely self-absorbed, all perfect mathematical point with no extension in space. Well, does nature strive for the horizon of the cosmos at any rate? I'll point out here that all points in space-time are constantly radiating from the omnicentric singularity of the ongoing Big Bang back toward the singularity at each point of its horizon because of the expanding nature of space-time, 
Um, all right, so I'm going to read this whole sentence. All points in space-time are constantly radiating from the omnicentric singularity of the ongoing Big Bang, so they're expanding out, back toward the singularity at each point of its horizon. Then once they get to the horizon of the cosmos, they radiate back in again with the cosmic microwave background radiation on elastic fundamental strings of energy. So most pertinently for establishing a parallel with Aquinas' cosmology, according to string theory, which fuses general relativity and quantum mechanics, all of nature is drawn inescapably to the singularity at each point of the cosmic horizon by the exponentially accelerating expansion of space-time, so that if we equate the singularity with the God archetype, we return to a teleological science of mind and matter that mirrors the cosmology laid out by Plato and perpetuated by Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas, and others. So, Everything is striving back toward the singularity that exists at each point of the horizon of the cosmos, if for no other reason than by the expansion of space-time itself. From our perspective here on Earth, all the galaxies around us are accelerating away from us at a, at a rate that increases with their distance from us, towards the horizon of the cosmos. Everything is expanding away from the central observational point back towards the horizon of the cosmos. If you were at the horizon of the cosmos, you would perceive yourself to be in the center of an expanding universe and us here on Earth to be at the horizon. But at any rate, this idea of everything ultimately returning to the singularity from which it radiates is another similarity with a teleological or purpose-driven cosmology with the ultimate purpose being to reunite with God. That's Aristotle. And you can see the similarities with holographic string theory. So, I say now, with that in mind, we turn for a moment to Susskind, who presents his string theory explicitly as the antidote to intelligent design theories, although ironically, his atheistic theory fits the hand of the creator God as described by Plato and his successors like a glove. So here is from Leonard Susskind's book, The Cosmic Landscape String Theory and the Illusion of Intelligent Design. So the illusion of intelligent design. So he'll, he admits that in the realm of physics and cosmology, quote, incredible miracles appear to abound, unquote. He says, quote, the appearance of intelligent design is undeniable. Extraordinary coincidences are required for life to be possible. For example, the cosmological constant, which he calls the mother of all physics problems. This is something that Einstein inserted into his general theory of relativity in 1917, two years after the original formulation, because he realized, according to his own theory, all of the matter in the universe should be attracting itself and the universe should be contracting. He believed the universe was static and unchanging and eternal, just like Aristotle thought. So he inserted this, this idea that space-time is expanding in just the right proportion to counteract the contraction of all matter for all other matter, that, which would cause it to collapse. He called that the cosmological constant. Just to go over some history here, George Lemaitre, a Jesuit priest from Belgium in 1927, the same year quantum mechanics was formulated in, with a large contribution from Wolfgang Pauli, in the realm of general relativity, this Jesuit priest physicist approached Einstein and he said, look, if you analyze your equations, you'll see that the universe should be expanding. And if that's the fact, if you go back far enough in the past, it should have been contracted into a single point. That was the Big Bang Theory. George Lemaitre, the Catholic priest, that all the universe was created from a point of infinite density, the gravitational singularity, even though he didn't call it that then. Einstein rejected Lemaitre's, he says, your math is good, but your physics is horrible. Two years later, Edwin Hubble in California, the Mount Wilson Observatory, he realized through this 100-inch lens of this reflective telescope, the biggest in the world at the time, that what was perceived to be starry nebula were actually independent galaxies and that they were expanding away from the Earth at an exponential rate. The distance to speed ratio is called the Hubble constant. At any rate, he presented that to Einstein. Einstein then said to Lemaitre, you're right, the universe is expanding, which means it did emerge from some extremely powerful point, although Einstein rejected the idea of the infinite gravity of the singularity. He thought that that was impossible. A lot of physicists do. 
Stephen Hawking believed in it at first, and then he rejected it because he pointed out himself. The Catholic Church in 1951, Pope Pius XII said that this theory of the Big Bang, it seems like it's a description of the moment of creation from the hand of God, which would equate God with the gravitational singularity. Because if the universe comes from the hand of God, and if the universe comes from a gravitational singularity, then that's the same thing. The gravitational singularity does have the characteristics of God as described by Aristotle and Plato and Augustine. It's a point of infinite power, so it's omnipotent. It contains all of the information describing the past, the present, and future of the entire universe. So in that sense, it's omniscient. It's omnipresent for various reasons which get complicated, but it's in the sense that it contains all of space and time, it's located at each point of space and time. The only thing that it doesn't have that God has is self-awareness. And you don't get that from physics, but when you see the parallels between the physics of the gravitational singularity and things like near-death experiences where people say they went out to the horizon of the cosmos and experienced an all-loving, omnipotent, and all-powerful God, then you have all of the ingredients that were originally there in the Platonic Aristotelian cosmology within which natural law theory was developed. Okay, so even Susskind admits, yeah, it seems as if this universe was designed intelligently because all of these constants of nature and the laws of nature have to be just right without the slightest variation or there couldn't have been human life. It seems as if this universe was custom designed with the most incredibly unlikely series of coincidences just to create human life. It definitely seems that way, he admits. But then he says it is an illusion, however, because string theory indicates not only that we have this universe, which seems so custom designed, but that it's just one in an infinite series of parallel universes. And when you have an infinite series of blind chance productions of these different laws of nature, it's inevitable that some of them will come out to be balanced in just the right way for human life to evolve. So he rejects intelligent design theory after admitting that it seems like it is, but when you factor in the multiverse, or what he calls the megaverse, then it just becomes a, a lucky, a series of lucky hits. However improbable, it becomes inevitable if you have an in, infinite number of attempts. That's his basic argument. Okay, so, nevertheless, the cosmology that he uses to defeat ideas of intelligently designed, uh, the intelligently designed universe, he didn't know it, but he was reasserting this ancient cosmology. So, uh, returning to Leo Strauss, he says, the historicist contention, that's the idea that there are no absolute standards of right and wrong. There are no absolute natural rights inherent in us. So he says, the historicist contention can be reduced to the assertion that natural right is impossible because philosophy in the fullest sense of the term is impossible. Philosophy is possible only if there is an absolute horizon or a natural horizon in contradistinction to the historically changing horizons or the caves. So the caves, that's Plato's cave allegory. According to Plato, this material world is like a subterranean cave. Very briefly, he says, imagine grabbing someone at birth, dragging them down into the subterranean cave, chaining them head to foot so that they can't turn their heads, forcing them to look at the back of the cave. Behind them, you put a wall. Behind that wall, you have soldiers. And they walk back and forth with puppets up on, on sticks. And then at the entrance, above the entrance to the cave is a blazing fire. So the fire casts a shadow off the puppets, which are projected onto the back wall. The prisoners, they can see their own shadows, their neighbors' shadows, and the shadows of the puppets, but they can't see each other physically. They take the two-dimensional shadows for reality. Now someone comes out of the, from the upper world into the cave, breaks the chains, turns the prisoner around. Look, this is reality. These are just shadows. The fire will blind their eyes at first. They won't be able to see anything. They'll think the shadows were more real. This liberator drags the prisoner up the rough, steep ascent of the cave into the outer world. They can at first see things at night only because the sunlight blinds their eyes so horribly. 
Then they can see reflections of the stars and the moon and puddles. Eventually they can look at things in broad daylight. Ultimately they can see the sun. And then they realize that everything comes from the sun. All of the things on the surface of the earth and the subterranean cave from which they were liberated, all of it originates from the sun. So here's the allegory, he says. As the fire in the cave is to the sun, so is the sun like the fire in the cave compared to the idea of the good. And that all of these three-dimensional objects that surround us, including our own bodies, are like shadows cast from these absolute ideas, all of which come from the idea of the good, the spiritual sun, which you can only see with the idea of the good. And until the leaders of society open the eye of the soul to the idea of the good, there can be no justice either in the individual lives or society as a whole. Psyche equal singularity is this idea of the good. And the fourth branch of government helps the other three branches harmonize their legislative and executive and judicial decisions with this ultimate universal ordering principle. The absolute horizon. So philosophy is possible only if there is an absolute horizon or a natural horizon in contradistinction to the historically changing horizons or the caves. The absolute horizon is the horizon of the cosmos described by holographic string theory. Because each part of this horizon contains all of the information that's contained in all of the other parts. That's the nature of absolute. Each part has the qualities of the whole. And that is the case with this holographic horizon of the cosmos. That's where the archetypes of the collective unconscious mind exist. Natural law theory says we have a right to pursue our natural desires, our instinctive desires. Instinct is the flip side of archetypes of the collective unconscious. Are there really archetypes of the collective unconscious? Yes, they're out at the horizon of the cosmos, just like Plato said they were. The ultimate idea of the good, or God, also exists out there with Aristotle agreed, at least with that point. His theory of the absolute ideas was different than Plato's, but he agreed that the ultimate archetype, the ultimate ordering principle, does exist out at the outermost horizon of the cosmos. And that now that we have reacquired this teleological conception of the universe, natural law theory can make more sense in a way that is acceptable, I argue, to the left and to the right. So I'll just read what I have here, this last sentence. Uh, the word, all right, so I conclude this paper by submitting to you that the equation, psyche equals singularity, which is equivalent to Plato's idea of the good, is the cultural fruit of at least two dozen centuries and represents the perfect union toward which we should aspire.